So hello everyone. I know that quite a few people are still joining. It takes a while once these webinars start for everyone to get in. But just in the meantime, I think a, a big welcome to the 11th property webinar hosted by Raymaker Marketing, which we're pretty chuffed about. But we've had a, a really amazing response to today. Uh, we've had well over 500 uh, people who've registered for the webinar. And I think that, that's it's wonderful. And it's just, we know people have got a hell of a lot going on. But I think it's credit to the panel we've got in front of us, where we've got serious experts across various different sectors of the property industry and a topic that we believe is, is super, super relevant. I mean, even just in the lead up of the last 10 or 15 minutes we've been chatting through, there's so much to talk through. And I, and I know we're not going to get through everything in, in an hour, but we certainly hope to, to facilitate a discussion that is unique and probably something that you wouldn't be able to, to get in another forum. Uh, just by way of introduction, quickly, Ma, for those of you who don't, know me or haven't been part of these things. My name is Stefan Buerta and I'm the director of Raymac Marketing. And my role tonight is really just to facilitate. I need to stay out the way as much as I can and leave it to the pros in terms of how um, of how they go through things. But I think just in terms of a little bit of context, we, we do these now every quarter. The last one we did was in April this year. There we covered the, the topic of the evolution of property trends. As we sort of come out of a bit of a hard lockdown, everyone is starting to get into, into various things. Since then, we've had, our, we've had more challenges. We've had uh, a COVID pandemic that won't go away, um, and we don't know how, how long it's going to be. But we really felt that this topic was exceptionally relevant to where we are right now. It's quite interesting that 13 months ago, Paul, Linda, and Lebo were on a talk where we literally, look, literally looked at the, the, the future of office spaces. And at that stage, we were still pretty much in hard lockdown. June last year, we were, there was a lot of a lot of visionary vision in terms of what was happening outside and we were talking about what is currently happening on the ground but nobody could have forecasted that we'd still be where we are and it's really interesting to now recap how much of it has come to where are we and what does the future look like and I think the big thing today is not the future for just for employees or for employers it's, it's for the, the whole ecosystem there's so many different components to it we've got landlords we've got people involved in, in different spaces we've got business owners um, and I think that's really the idea around um, around tonight in terms of honest, transparent um, discussions. And then I think we really want to assess, are we stuck with Zoom meetings, smaller offices, and remote working? Or are we going to go back to what we knew before? Or most likely, where do we find a middle ground and what does that hybrid look like um, in the future? So I think just by way of introduction, again, a big thank you to, uh, to our panel uh, very, very grateful to have you guys on board. I'm just going to do a quick little introduction before we get going. Uh, and excuse me if I, if, I, if I keep it quite summarized because there's a lot to talk about when it comes to you guys. But I think um, Lebo Khang Shole, who is uh, who's returning from the previous uh, webinar we had. So Lebo is uh, Executive Head um, of National Facilities and Property for a company you guys may have heard of. It's called Vodacom. And, um, and I think it's interesting to note that Vodacom employs over 5,000 people in South Africa. So if you look at a real test case of how the pandemic, COVID, remote working has influenced one business and how they've innovated and how they've looked at things differently, I think it's a really, really good example. So Lebo, thanks and, and awesome to have you. Then uh, Lynette and Tudy, who um, I've been trying to get onto one of these panels for a long time. Uh, she is uh, a wonder woman in so many different, different uh, instances the founder and CEO of Innate Investment Solutions, but also an award-winning media personality and just has so much uh, knowledge in so many different segments of the property sector. So, Annette, welcome um, to our panel tonight. Uh, and then Paul Collenberg, uh, if you have been living under a rock and you're not too sure who Growth Point are, just a, a little bit of an intro, but Growth Point are the, the largest property investment fund in the country. They're also the largest, as a result, largest landlord in the country. And their combined asset value across all the different sectors is north of 150 billion rand. And Paul is the head of asset management in the office sector for Growth Point. So Paul, um, yeah, wonderful to have you here. And I think it's just so relevant. Um, and I think a lot of perspective in terms of, of, of where we are. Uh, Linda Trim, uh, who's director of Future Space and also director of Giant Leap. So Future Space is a flexible office space uh, environment and Giant Leap in the office interior and ergonomic field, which... Um, is also quite interesting in terms of what the requirements are, both in terms of the employee and the employer when it comes to times like we're in at the moment. Um, Sheila Pajeng, how's it, Sheila? Uh, you, did, you did so well on our last webinar that we thought we'd get you back for, for today. But uh, yeah, I think a, a wealth of knowledge in so many sectors, uh, managing director of several real estate management, a speaker and a, and a serious property mind. 
And then last but not least, uh, Justin Blend, who is um, new to our, our webinars. Um, so AfriQuest Properties, uh, very interesting in the sense that they are currently the fastest office to residential convert in the country, a portfolio of close to 3,000 residential apartments, but also a really large a commercial portfolio. And I think that gives you quite a balanced outlook in terms of uh, where things are going. So uh, how's it, Justin? Thanks for, thanks for being part of it. And now I think just a, a couple of house rules. I mean, I don't need to tell you guys about webinars and, and Zoom meetings. I know we've all got fatigue from it, but uh, a couple of things at the bottom of your screen, there is an option to, to ask questions. Please ask questions. Uh, that, that's exactly what these, these discussions are around. You'll see the guys in the backgrounds. There's no logos. There's no... It's not a hard sell thing. This is all about providing really, really good insights. If your questions are bad, I won't ask them. <laughs> if they're good, I'll, I'll, I'll pass them on. And I'll just work out where they go in terms of from a panelist perspective. Now, if you lose your connection, you know, just go back onto, onto the link. And from a timing perspective, we really want to get through this in 60 minutes max. It's not going to go over that. We know we won't be able to cover everyone's questions. We'll go through the wealth of different knowledge. But the reality is time is important. So, um, We'll get through as much as you possibly can. And then we will be doing a recording. It's being recorded as we, as we go, which gives everyone the opportunity to be able to um, forward on to friends or colleagues um, or to better watch it. So we'll send that mail out tomorrow to everyone who had registered. But yeah, I think let's, uh, let's get into it. I think, Lebo, I'm going, to, I'm going to throw the first question to you. I think I'm fascinated by real live scenarios. I think we spoke about Vodacom and the amount of people you employ. Um, I think that... The question for me is, is, how's it going for you guys? How have you adopted to, to the office structure? How's it worked for you guys and how's it going for your employees? So, Stefan, I mean, this has been a journey of about 18 months now, uh, you know, since the, you know, pan pandemic started. And, you know, as, you know, major business, uh, you know, a lot of us have been trying to navigate around, you know, office dynamics in the workplace. And it's driven a lot of, it's made, a lot of corporates actually look into creating what's called a working from home policy for employees because, you know, you got to provide that level of um, flexibility for staff to enable them to, you know, be able to deliver and produce and be productive in their everyday lives because, you know, the world has not stopped. You know, we need, we've got clients, we've got customers, we have to deliver services and products. So the investments that, that have been you know, think to be made towards uh, staff being able to, to continue on what they have to do has driven us to make sure that, first of all, you get a digital experience, uh, make sure we're actually able to provide all the IT equipment for yourself to work from home, including even the furniture uh, to continue doing what it is you have you know, to do. So there's been, you know, I'd say from big business, there's been a lot of investment in that regard to ensure that, you know, as we navigate through this uh, pandemic, uh, work continues. And what's driven us to do is look into going forward now as we are able to roll out the vaccines in this country, you know, eventually get to a scenario of, you know, having receiving a 60-40 ratio whereby 60% of the staff can work from the office and 40% uh, will continue to work from home. I mean, that translates into possibly about um, three days a week uh, in the office and two um, at um, home uh, being able to do so because really Stefan you need to build a company culture within within staff and you know we, we're busy on onboarding new employees and I think for me is how do you inculcate uh, to a new staff member company culture values ethos you know, all those wonderful um, things, especially from an HR perspective. So, you know, the plan is that, you know, you got to get to this hybrid model. And we have seen this, you know, with examples from the US, especially in the tech groups, uh, whether it is Google or Apple, encouraging staff uh, to come back in a, in, a, in, a, in, a in a hybrid model. So I think what was planned to be a very, short maybe six month period ended up being an 18 month um, journey of you know establishing new norms and the new way of working. Yeah and um, Lynette I just want to bring you in here because I think uh, Lebo touched on, on that culture which I think is really important and I was actually going to get there a little bit later but I think that the, the, the biggest thing I mean I, and I think Justin said it as we were, we were preparing for this it's just about how 
we can look at trends um, and, and we can see what, what's happening internationally. We're always going to check a couple of months behind. I think the, the question to you is, is, do you think we're going to see this as this, sort of, this working from home thing internationally as, a, as an ongoing element? And how do businesses and corporates manage to maintain culture when half the staff in many cases haven't even met each other? Mm, um, it's quite interesting. Um, it's an interesting dynamic because I think we've all come to appreciate that culture in an organization ultimately is almost the life source of any organization. It doesn't matter how amazing your technology is, um, your processes, your people are, the infrastructure you have available to you, but culture is almost like the, the, the central meeting point and the melting pot of um, who you are, how you choose to operate in the world of business, um, what your goals are as an organization, and, and ultimately even the impact you hope to make internally, but also on you know, the, the external world. So culture is the blueprint that um, organizations try and reinforce with their people on the inside because they want you and I as the customers on the outside um, to feel the value and the impact of that. Um, working remotely means that that, that connectedness, um, that central melting pot is far more complex um, to not only create together to reinforce, but also um, far more difficult to embed because you're now trying to mesh it um, across different um, environments um, without the personal human touch. You are also trying to do it in many instances, um, particularly over the last 18 months, with individuals, personalities, egos, um, socialization, lived experiences um, of people who haven't actually physically ever met each other. Um, so they don't quite know how to vibe, how to share energy with each other, share space with one another, um, even listen to each other in many instances. So it's becoming more difficult, but I think what it, it, it perhaps puts at the forefront for most of our organizations um, at the moment is that if you didn't have culture at the center, um, these hybrid formats of working and using space um, force you to um, put a very significant amount of time, effort, um, and energy into reinforcing the company culture. But it also forces you to invest in the infrastructure, um, as it were, of ensuring you can maintain that culture. So if you've previously been bad at communicating everything from your values to the need for meetings, agendas, targets, strategy, um, this is going to force you to do that. And those are all sort of your building blocks um, of culture. It's going to force you to really look at, um, have you made it easy for people to connect from their remote um, locations? It's also going to have to make us organized. And whilst we're all in different locations and we've provided um, technology, cameras, et cetera, for people to try and work together, it's really also going to force a situation whereby we really look at what does teamwork mean to us? Um, and how do we make sure that the ability of people to not just be productive, but also to share in the connectedness of being human in order for us to deliver to the outside world? is something that within our company-wide initiatives um, that we keep working on refining, getting input on, but also making sure um, that it's something that's comfortable and is able to work. So it's, you know, they say change is an inside job. And I think, you know, the big infrastructure change, um, you know, around us going to hybrid was probably the easy part. Um, but the harder parts are going to be really fully understanding how we create um, community capability and capacity in our organizations in a very, very different world. And Linda, what do you think from your side are the biggest possible complexities we're going to face if we continue with this remote hybrid? I think what's going to happen is you're going to have people that desperately want to come back to, to work. Well, they're going to come back to the office, realize what they've actually missed out on. And then you'll get other people that will choose to stay at home or companies will say, if you're not vaccinated, you've got to stay at, at home. And then we're going to start to face challenges because as a leader, how do you manage some people in the office and some people at home? How does your career grow if you don't come to the office and your counterparts do? Well, human, human talent or human ways 
You speak to people that are present around you. You've got to think twice to phone that person at home. So it puts a lot of added pressure onto a leader or onto a team to keep communicating with people that are not coming to the office. And yes, this hybrid office sounds wonderful and utopia, but how are you going to work it out when everyone wants to come to the office on the same day? So it also has a, a managerial challenge. How do you make sure the relevant people are at the office on the right day? And I think South Africa is a little bit different to Europe in that our commutes are probably not as long. So that also puts us in a very different place for people to come to the office. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and Linda, I mean, I think it's always trying to find the balance between what works best for both parties. And we'll talk about productivity a little later because that's also a, a big challenge. How do you measure that? Do you get the productivity? I know guys, like I saw a release recently from Capitec where they said their sick days were down and their, their productivity was up. I don't know if that works in, in principle across the board. Um, who knows? But I think the biggest thing is what, what is the modern day employee looking for from office space? They definitely want It's not even a question. And often I try to remain very open-minded and I ask you know, people, what do they love about working from, from home? People have got stuck in a rut because this has gone on way longer than anticipated. Yes, people don't like to have traffic, um, but that said, they love to sit in their pajamas and work and talk, turn off the cameras. They love the fact that they can clean the house and cook dinner in office hours. So they feel like they've got a lot more time in their day. But is that also fair to an employer? So, you know, in New York, a lot of companies are saying, if you want your New York salary, well, then you actually need to come back to work. Yeah. So, and, you know, there was actually a very interesting thing that I listened to. And as a leader of a, a company, when you've got to make a big decision, do you send out a survey to your staff to ask them about a big financial decision? And that's kind of what's happened with this work from home. Companies have sent out mass surveys and they're letting employees choose the future company. So yes, people want flexibility, but is it actually right for innovation and creativity? What's actually right for an organization going forward? So we do have to try to find that balance. 100%. Uh, and then Paul, I, I, think, I think it's really important to understand from a, from a landlord perspective. I mean, it's, it's obviously, challenging times but it's also exciting change at times and I know you guys have innovated in so many different ways and looked at things so differently how how's this pair been for you guys and how have you had to look relook at things a little slightly differently and and, and where's the innovation areas that you guys are, are are pretty excited about thanks Steph so I think a, a couple of things and I think Lynette spoke to a lot of the cultural issues about um working from home or, or working virtually the effects on, on organizations but I think what we haven't spoken about is how working from home affects your clients. Because I think with established clients and established relationships, you can work remote or, or have a virtual relationship, but to build a new relationship with a new client is, is very hard. Um, and, and we're finding a lot of our, um, our people, but also our clients want to meet. They want to meet, uh, even if it's at a coffee shop outside, but have some kind of interaction. Um, I think though, and, and um, Linda touched on it as well. I, th I think that we are looking at some kind of hybrid solution. I mean, the, the past 18 months has been tough for landlords, um, but I think it's, it's the, uh, the problems are two pronged. Firstly, uh, the dy dynamics about how much office space people need. And I think a lot of uh, companies don't know how much they need at this stage. They're still assessing their needs. They're still assessing ways to work. But I think probably the greater problem for landlords at the moment is the economy. The fact that the lockdown has had a huge impact on the economy. Um, and a lot of our tenants can't afford the space they're in at the moment. And we need the economy to grow. We need to see um, people coming back to work and creating some kind of groundswell of activity to, to grow this economy, to fill up the space we have. Uh, I do think though that, uh, and, and you mentioned innovative ways of working. I think that the nature of the office is going to change. I think there will always be some element of remote working and the things that you can do on your own, you can do at home. You don't have to come to the office to do that. But if you're coming to the office to collaborate, to see other people, the, the, the actual infrastructure in your office needs to accommodate that. And I think a lot of offices don't do that. So I think there's, it's quite exciting to see how 
office layouts are evolving and how, how to bring people back and what then their requirements will be once they do come back. Um, and I'm hoping that some of our outdated um, preconceptions about offices, like the fact that you need six parking bays per 100 square meters, I'm hoping those fall away because again, if not everybody's in the office every day, do you need all that parking? And for a developer, that's hugely expensive to build and, and, a, and a waste of, of resources. So can we be more clever with our resources? Can we provide um, things that are actually important to, to the people who are working uh, in that environment? Um, I think that's going to be the challenge going forward. And then, and then Paul, just quickly, there's a, there's a question that's come to you from Rory Wilkinson, which I think it, it gets, it goes to your point about it, it's economic conditions, but just it would be interesting to get a sense of the impact of rentals um, and how big an impact have we seen over this period? Um, so I think part of the problem was, well, let me first say that it's very nodally based, so that some nodes have sustained much better than others. I think nodes that had an oversupply of offices to begin with and, and Santon is being talked about a lot as, as a place where, with the moving of the Khao train or the advent of the Khao train, everybody wanted new buildings up on the top of the ridge and uh, there were vacancies and um, it, it was an oversupply already. So I think those nodes have been hardest hit and um, rentals haven't grown. In fact, they've gone backwards by, depending where they are, but but um, probably about 10 to 15% in certain areas. And some landlords are happy to get it, just somebody into their offices. So um, they, they will look at doing deals or staggered rentals uh, on, on buildings that are not popular. But there are nodes that are. There, there are nodes that still see a lot of demand. Um, what we're seeing is, is two things. I think people are trading up in terms of location. So you can move from Randburg to Santon at the same rental and, and why not do that and, and have those amenities. Um, and the second thing that's becoming more and more important is green and sustainability and, and an efficient building. And can you, and there used to be a premium to those buildings, but I think there no longer is. So you can now get a better building, a more efficient building for the same rental. Um, and I think that's, we've seen that as a quite a large trend. And I guess that's why the vacancies in the triple A grade space is so much lower than, than you would think currently, as opposed to in the lower sections, like you say, guys are, um, guys are sparring up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Justin, I think from, from your side, in terms of uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, I think Paul spoke earlier about um, downscaling and, and, and certain guys are needing, requiring less space. I mean, Lebo spoke about it. What do you think? Are we, are we going to see guys taking a lot less space in the future? I think it's, uh, I've got a few thoughts on it. I think, first of all, it's a bit too early to tell. Second of all, I do agree with all the other panelists what they've said today. I don't understand the hybrid model. I think that's a temporary thing. I think in the long term, everyone will return to the office full time. I can't understand how you can split your time and back and forth. And it just doesn't make sense to me. But, uh, you know, just a few thoughts on the matter is, you know, I think most of the polls are, and touching on what Linda said, not accurate. They're asking the wrong people. If you were... Uh, if you're an employee and you're not too worried about the profits of a company and you guaranteed your salary, well, quite frankly, I'd also rather sit at home, not be with my family, be with my children, not have to sit in traffic and make sense. But if you're a business owner and you, you, you need to worry about profitability, well, most people we speak to, most business owners, they're able to sustain their business, but they're not able to really grow their business. And if you look at it like the Olympics, and this is where I think my the only point I'm really adding value to here, the conversation and the subject is, if everyone's in the same playing boat and everyone's training, say, for the Olympics for the 100-meter sprint three days a week, well, then you're fine. But as soon as your competition goes and trains seven days a week, in other words, then, then, then you screw it. They will annihilate you. You will not stand a chance against them. And business is the same. Companies who are not functioning optimally by working at home, they will not be able to compete with the companies that are back in the office. The companies in the back office, they'll, they'll finish, they'll annihilate the companies that are, are um, still uh, working from home uh, you know in business only the strong can survive and therefore I ultimately think that people will return to the offices will people take less space uh, maybe in the short term but i don't know we're not seeing that we, we're seeing most of the companies that are coming up for renewal now that said to us uh, at the beginning of the hard lockdown that they'll never need space again uh, most of them not all but most are renewing their leases for the same amount of space that they're currently in very interesting yeah um Michelle, what are your thoughts there Look, I, I, 
with, without sounding very repetitive to some of the points that I made, I think it's very easy to fall into a trap of a numbers game, right? Now, 10 years ago, 2012, roundabout, um, when online trading on online retail was the thing, we, we had um, conferences at the time, whether you went to a support conference, wherever else, and everybody was says, that's the death of a shopping center. And, 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 and there were presentation to death about mega shopping centers are dying. Now, in tw within that 10 years, we have had um, Mall of Africa built, we have had Manling being expanded, we have had four ways being expanded. So, so I agree with Justin on one point that sometimes you must not fall into a trap of a fad just because we are going through an event. Um, you are walking through a forest. Uh, you, you might come to an end of a forest and then you know, you, there are no longer woods to worry about. So, so we must be careful of that. The second point is around what um, I think Lynette was making. It's, it's the human part that we're leaving behind because when, when you do these webinars around moving back to office space, you, you get two camps. The one camp, it's, it's, it's worries about the physical environment of going back to the office, and the other camp worries about the technology environment. But what is left in, in the middle is the humanity that goes with that, um, with that decision. Um, the issue of whether to survey the employees or do whatever. And then I'll use an example while we're still preparing that Lynette was using to say, when they went to vaccinate, um, they took a decision to say, if we vaccinate, um, yes, we'll be fine, but what about the rest of the ecosystem that you operate within? Um, our, our horticulture executive, our domestic director, how about them if we, if we don't include them in this? And, and, and there's a point around that, is the thing called inclusion as a culture, deliberate inclusion as a culture, that we, we don't fall into a trap of elitism in making this decision because let's, let's, let's make me point about what I mean by inclusion as a culture. So what's the cost of somebody working at home? So all of a sudden, I'm a household. I used to pay electricity of 250, argument sake. And the rest of the time I'm at, I'm at work. So that means I don't have to carry that cost, that additional burden, right? Now, in the 18 months, my salary remained the same, but I had this additional cost that I had to worry about because everybody's at home, the kids are running around, they are eating themselves to death. And now I've got my cost has tripled and my salary has remained behind. So it will be beneficial to me as an individual to actually go back to the office because my income statement and my balance sheet will look better if I'm back at the office. So, so that's the humanity part that we tend to leave behind to say, what are the decision points that are being made outside of the fact that there's a rental that needs to be paid at the offices? Me, as a household, there is a cost that I pay for working at home over and above the productivity that my employer is worried about. Finally, there's, there's a big point around social competition. What is social competition? And, and this is issue about socialization and all of that, um, is that if you look at your wardrobe, or you look at the car you've parked in the garage or the shoes you're wearing, chances are 80% of your wardrobe exists because you're going to the office. Well, after you stop going to the office, 80% of your wardrobe stop being relevant to your life. So there's a reason in which a role that the, being at the office plays on the economy that is hidden, that we don't see, that if I go to the office, I'm more interested because social competition says, I want to be dressed better than the guy who's gonna be sitting next to me. As a result, there's a certain proportion of my money that I have to invest in retail. So as a result, retail start performing because those activities are linked to me going to the office. So when people stop going to the office, there's a, an effect within that ecosystem that if we worry narrowly about what, what the office environment is about, whether you're going back, you're not going back, is that we miss those blind spots around what is the role of, the, of being at the office? Um, uh, you, you worry about the fact that people drive up and down. Is it better for me to drive up and down or sit in an environment where I have to spend 12 hours um, working with kids making noise up and down? So those choices, I think we need to begin to factor them in to say, what is the human cost of working at home vis-a-vis, -vis, and it's a cost-benefit analysis, and that cost vis-a-vis -vis that household going back to the office. Chances are the decisions are going to be made on the human factor 
rather than on the physical stuff that we are worried about. Because the impact, whether you're talking mental health, you're talking all of those things are valued far higher than the physical stuff that, that we worried about. My final point is what, what Paul was saying around the policy environment. One of the things is that the policy environment lags. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a policy impact on working at home. Is SARS going to give me my rebate? Now, if SARS tomorrow wake up and says, we're going to change the tax policy to accommodate all of the 30% that everybody can claim because they're working at home, they'll be broke very quick. You understand? If the municipality has to change the rules to say, we need to be able to accommodate this thing, that is not gonna happen. So you are still going to be limited to, in terms of your bylaws, to a certain proportion of your property to be used for commercial purposes and the rest. So at some point, when you get to the end of right now, we might be having leniency in terms of the policymakers, but I suspect that at the end of COVID, whether it's 2022 or 2023, those same policymakers are gonna come back and say, and hit us very hard to say, you are exceeding the, the law, what the law allows. So some of these things might end up making us taking different decisions. So it will sit somewhere where Justin is saying to say that it's, it's let, let's, let's, because we are in the woods, well, you know, because we are in the forest, you must not confuse the trees from the woods. Um, yeah. We will see the clearer picture when you come out onto the other side. And South Africa is also different. We've got traveling problems. There's a class segregation. Um, we've got an employee who lives in Soshanguve. We've supplied all of the equipment. Unfortunately, in Soshanguve, they don't have a, a good connectivity. For that person to be productive, they have to be at the office. Those are some of the class decisions that we're going to have to make, which are, has nothing to do with whether my rental is 100 rand, wherever it is, whatever. I have to take as a business to say, I will work better if that person is sitting behind a desk than frustrating them trying to get connectivity somewhere in the middle of, of Soshanguve. That will be my point, Stefan. Justin, do you, do you want to add there? Um, I know you went off mute there. No, no, I'm good. I mean, the, the, okay. I, I agree with everything Marcelo was saying. And there's huge, huge structural issues if people don't go to the office because, for instance, council, uh, job, uh, city councils that are generally bankrupt in South Africa collect most of their income from rates and taxes. If people aren't going back to the office, that means rentals drop, which means property prices drop, which means there's much, much less income coming into municipalities, which means, I don't know how they're going to, municipalities will operate. The guy who sells shoes, you know, or the guy who owns a Subway sandwiches type of a steers or whatever it may be next to an office building, their business, that, that, that whole social construct uh, it falls away, which is a, that whole economic and micro environment. It's a big problem. Just just a, a one comment. I think it's made by Megan uh, Richardson, and I, I want to link that level to a question that has come through for Megan Swan, and just to direct it at you. But basically, says our company uses tech to manage at home, uh, plus tech to manage movements of information. I work hard at home, though no time to digest meeting after meeting. Uh, Megan, you sound like a real overachiever. <laughs> Thank you, but look bad. But I think, I think there's another uh, a question from Megan Swan. It just says, how does one measure and control productivity of staff when they're working remotely? Um, it might work really well for uh, Megan, who, uh, who's unbelievably good at what she does. But how do you monitor that across different segments of an organization? So, Stefan, I mean, these um, tools have been put in place mm -hmm. essentially to assist staff. So I'm fully aware of what Megan is referring to, to the tools that measure productivity, because most corporates actually do have those tools. And what they do is, is actually give you, you know, it gives you data and also analytics as the, as the, as the, as the employee for you to understand how much time are you spending in meetings or, collab or collaborating or discussing or being innovative. And it's feedback to yourself in the sense that, you know, it guides you to be able to manage and coordinate your day much more you know, efficiently. And what I know is that a lot, a lot of um, companies actually uh, putting in a, let's say a no meet or, or a free meeting zone, um, you know, time especially around the lunchtime period, because, you know, staff do get exhausted. Uh, it does get extremely exhausting, uh, especially when, you know, you run from half past seven in the morning until eight at, eight at night in meetings, because what needs to happen is that, you know, there needs to be 
timelines given of, you know, these are the basic hours that you need to be available. And then I think have those meeting free zones, um, you know, around the lunchtime sort of no meetings at, at all. But those analytics, uh, to be honest, Stefan, I, I use them myself. Uh, you know, the MS Office 360 plat platform allows that and it gives a kind of data which helps you to understand, you know, you know what your day it looks like, you know, how much time is spent on what and you're able to maneuver and navigate around that so that you can, you're able to improve your own employee well, you know, your own employee well, well-being uh, because, you know, health and safety does play a significant part in what it is you do on, on a day-to-day -day basis, to be honest. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Linda, I mean, I think the, the office ergonomics uh, does fascinate me and, and I know you've spoken about before, but I've already also mentioned in, in past discussions that it needs to work both ways. There's requirements from an employer and there's requirements from an employee. It can't work, can't work one-sided. What, are, what, what, um, what, is, what is the optimal structure around that currently and, and how do you think that all evolved? What we're finding is some of our, our clients, the bigger corporates who want to go to this hybrid model are now having to provide each staff member a chair desk and a UPS to work at home. But then the challenge comes, you can't go and ask people where they live, very much what Michelle said, you know, it's someone's private space, everyone lives in a completely different way class so what they've had to do is actually let people choose to say do you want a desk and a chair or can you only fit a chair in and then you've got to put delivery systems in place and then you know what happens if that person leaves the company who gets to keep the chair has the chair been damaged by the children going forward but the reality is that particularly for the length of time that we've been at, at home people are dying from um, mental wellness issues and physical wellness issues. People have got sore backs from sitting poorly. Um, people have got complete Zoom fatigue. And it's actually something I want to go and research is people now feel that when you talk to a computer, you've got to talk in a louder manner. So people's hearing's now been affected. <laughs> laughing, but it's, I've actually watched a few things on it. So I want to go research it to see the real effect. So they've got to shout at the, the computer. So it causes more exhaustion at the end of the day. You sit in a poorly lighted environment. So we're creating huge challenges for people and, and almost going back to Megan's question, which relates. It doesn't matter, I get that tracking at the end of the day and half the time it makes no sense to what my day actually was. You cannot put a price tag on seeing people and the trust and the loyalty that you build from seeing people in person. <clears throat> so if I've had a busy day as a leader, I can glance at any tech score that comes through. But if you've actually walked past me and I've had a conversation, that's what's going to stick in my mind at the end of the day, not that score that I read on my computer. Uh, Stefan, just, just the point um, and, and on that, I mean, I mean it, it's a very important point that Linda is making. And, 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 and somebody made a, a very passing remark, which is, it says, at least my employer knows where I live. You know, um, because the good thing about this is that, especially big companies, most big companies they didn't even know how, where, what about their employees. They were just happy when the guy comes and taps at the, at the front door and then he's there nine to five, goes home. So the good thing we must also acknowledge that now most employers know the environment in which people live and what is the expectation, if they're expecting certain level of productivity, what does that mean in practice, right? And we hope that whether you're going a hybrid model or you stay, which, whichever model is that, that data is not lost in the statistics. Um, because to go tech is very easy to go tech, but the, the, there's, there's that data that you're collecting that says, if I look, if, if I have to heat map my, the population of my staff from the top to the bottom, the bottom up, um, and, and this is what, what Linda is talking about, to say a, a certain type of a chair is relevant here, but not relevant there. That goes also to decision making, to say my decision making processes about whether you are serving all the stuff is that those decision making processes, how do I make sure that they represent now the, the demographics of the employees that I deal with? Because 
I suspect that somebody shared the statistics, I forgot who about, they did a, a sort of an adoptal study about who are people who are willing to come back and those are unwilling to come back. I'm very sure that if you do a similar statistics based on the demographics of your staff, th there will be certain patterns that start to emerge to say the choices to come back might be purely based not only on the work environment, uh, but it's based on other things that we are blindsided by. So that when we say we have moved from nine to five, we have actually moved from nine to five. For some people, they've moved from 10 to 10. So I start 10 in the morning, I finish 10 at night. And then you are able to determine for those people, I suspect the ones that are doing 10 to 10 are the ones that are likely to choose to go to work. And, and I'm just thumb sucking anecdotally. And the guys that are still comfortable with the nine to five are comfortable to be at home because the environment allows them to be at home. Um, and that becomes very important. There, there is a reason why Google or Apple moved out of a garage to go and open up a, a, an office. There was a reason they moved out of a garage. If it was convenient, they would have continued to work um, in, they would have continued to grow in the garage. You can't grow a business on your dining room table. It's not possible, it's not practical. What, what uh, Mashila saying is so true because going, you know, more than even just the ergonomics, I think to draw people out of their homes because people have got stuck at home, it's become a, a poor routine. You've got to create an experience for people to come back to the office. And that might be a good cup of coffee or nice meeting rooms or great facilities. People are not going to settle for a poor grade office if they could sit at home in their fluffy slippers and work as they want to, the times that they want. So we've got to do more in an office environment for people. Yeah, which is a really exciting um, challenge and opportunity for employers. And I think if, if guys can embrace it, it can only be, be positive. Um, Lynette, I just want to ask you a question. Justin, I, I do want to come back to you afterwards and just touch on um, office refurbs um, and conversions, because I think that's also a really interesting thing I want to chat to Paul about. But um, Lynette, a question from Rory Wilkinson, which is basically touches on, do we think that companies will start offering incentives for employers to go back to the office in the future? What are your thoughts there? Mm, I absolutely see it. Um, I see it because very much just to the last point that was being made, um, you know, in terms of if we are also trying to maintain culture, but also enhance collaboration, um, you know, environments are going to say, how do we create experiences and just the creation of that experience um, on its own is going to be something that draws people from home. Secondly, I think, you know, it's a very tricky um, catch-22 to be in as a property owner and um, the situation we find ourselves in because you in many ways have um, paid upfront for the infrastructure that you have. You've continued paying rentals if that's applicable or any costs of ownership to the space that you have. And I think nothing at the moment is probably more difficult than shedding um, commercial space um, uh, into the current markets and environments um, and, you know, how, how in the dynamics, obviously, and the economics of dealing with that. So at, at some point, I think um, organizations are going to have to work towards saying how best with the space that we have available, um, can we better in, um, incentivize, but also draw people back so that the return on our continued effort really to sustain these assets is something that we're going to continue to see. Um, but um, also what's also going to happen, and I think it's a, it's a fantastic collaboration, is really the collaboration between people and property. Um, you know, in many instances, and if you look at specifically our markets, um, our commercial and retail markets, We've always, um, you know, traded almost on the adage of um, build it and the people will come. Now, this new normal and these great big adjustments and transitions that come with it are so reliant on um, follow what the data people will give to you from surveys, from their activity, from trends and patterns, and then custom build around that. And I think that people and consumer led um, occupation of space, whether it's commercial or it's retail or it's industrial, is going to um, force us to think a little bit deeper about what will incentivize a return to the use of available space, as opposed to us just incentivizing people to return to use space we know is available. Um, so it's, 
it's almost saying the same thing, but contextually and in application, it's actually two completely different um, applications, but also continued management practices. Um, so I think everybody who owns a building, who's renting a building, has available space, is going to have to think very quickly in terms of, is your space accessible and inclusive, worth the daily experience and commute? Um, and do people ultimately want to use it? And if you don't have that answer, then you also can't answer for yourself whether you'll ever return to a full office or not. Thanks. And, and Linda, I mean, the concept of flexible office space, I mean, how much does that talk to what the data saying now? I mean, I, I actually read a, a stat, uh, which actually came from a research team, where the Asia Pacific have got something like 11,500 flexible workspaces across the, the area, where South Africa at that stage was less than 100. So, I mean, there, there, there's, I mean, how much has that space evolved in, in the short period? Listen, future space skyrocketed. We've actually had to sign for additional space. But I think we've been in a very different position to other flexible spaces because of the type of space we offer. It's a little bit different to co-working space and that it's what we term pro-working. Each person pre-COVID and before we even knew what was coming, always had a lot of space in our environment. It was very spaced out. It wasn't people jam-packed on top of each other. So we've run out of space and COVID skyrocketed the, the business, which we never anticipated. I think it's been twofold. One, there are a lot of people that just can't work from home and they can afford to work in a flexible space every day when they can't go into their offices. And two, I think South Africa is very different to um, an international climate. You can't compare it. There are a lot of international companies in South Africa that due to the political uncertainty here and instability will not allow them to sign leases at the moment. I think based a lot on this hybrid work and based on the, the country, so they want to rather sign a year at a time. And we're finding big corporates that had occupied a few thousand square meters are now coming and signing for 100 people for a year at a time. And then I guess if countries settle down and they know how much space they actually will have, then they can go and sign a long-term lease with Growth Point or someone else. We hope so. But can I come? <laughs> yeah, of course, so, so I think a collaborative workspace and flexible workspace um, offers is a range of offerings. But I think what tenants are looking for at the moment, in, in times of change, people want the flexibility. They don't want to sign for three years if they don't know if they're going to have a business in six months' time. Um, so I think that it, it fulfills a specific need or, or a great need, in fact, to take flexible space. You can grow, you can shrink. Um, and you can change your mind and you're not tied in for a long period of time. And I think there is a role there. I think we see um, that going forward, there could be, we talk about a hybrid model, but there could be a hybrid model in buildings where you have um, long-term leases for most of the space, but that you have other, you can rent a boardroom downstairs or an auditorium or, or rent overflow um, space um, whenever you need it. So the ability to shrink and grow as your, as your business shrinks and grows. And uh, I think the landlords have to be more receptive to the needs of, of clients. Uh, and, and flexibility is one of those needs. The one issue, big issue with hybrid space, though, is and the flexibility, while it's wonderful, you pay for it in a major way. It's incredibly expensive. So if you compare what it costs your rent per square meter for hybrid space versus uh, a lease that you, yes, you are more locked into, it's, it's, it's probably three, four, five times the price. So if you do know that you are going to be in the office and, and that you need the space for time to come, uh, it pays you to take a longer lease because it's a huge cost saving. That's actually not true, Justin. And I, I tell you, what, I mean, I sit on both sides of the, the fence because Giant Leap obviously does clients that are moving with, with leases and then future space on the flexible side. If you're a company less than 45 people, it's actually cheaper to be in flexible space. You don't need to have cleaning services. You don't need to have receptionists. You don't need to have your own canteen. You don't have fit out costs. You don't have technology costs. We um, modeled it on Excel. It was four times the price. Your, your model is definitely different to- I'd love to, you to send me your models. Do <laughs> we, do it, we do it daily. And as I say, I sit on both sides of the, the fence completely. But, um, for a, a young business or smaller businesses, those setup costs are enormous. Uh, 
Yeah, I do think there's a range of models though. So I mean, we're, we're talking about collaborative workspace at, at the one extreme and a form of the, the other extreme. And I think there will be solutions between the two. I, I think where collaborative workspace fell down was um, when you're worried about COVID and, and how healthy your neighbor is, you want to know who you're sitting next to. And I think so that there was a, a, a crash in that kind of space for a while. But um, so we're also associated with Workshop 17, which does something very similar. And the interesting part at the moment is that a year down the line, some of the locations are flying because they're the right locations. And some of the locations which, which relied on eventing or uh, seminars or that kind of thing aren't, aren't doing well. So it's, again, it comes back to the right solution for the right business. I think it depends what your business does and how it operates. Um, but I think, again, we need to be able to uh, provide a range of solutions to find the right solution for, for each group. But Stefan, this talks to how flexible is our, our, our sector? I mean, I mean the, our property sector compared to um, other markets um, it tends to be very sticky, um, um, very, very sticky. I mean, if, if you look at I mean, let, let's take an example, at least the one that uh, Stefan was talking, I mean, sorry, Justin was talking about with Linda. So if, if you are, a, let's say, a small business, you're looking for a, a flexi office um, that is permanent, um, whether whichever, I'm not going to name the companies that gives flexi offices, you're probably paying about four and a half thousand per person, right? Um, and then, and it grows from there. You might get a discount in terms of the number of people that you're bringing in. If you look at a collaborative space, you get a little bit of a discount. You might be sitting at around two and a half per person or 3,000 a person. Now, if you are a, a company of six or seven or up to 10 people, you probably need around somewhere around 300 to 400 square meters. You, you will get that at a rate closer to it, less than a thousand rand per person. Um, that's the reality of it. Um, that the, if, but if you take the same companies that are operating here, the flexi office, and you compare their rates, whether um, in the UK, some of them are from the UK, and you compare some of them have got a major play in Australia. The rates that they're doing, they're doing there are far, far more in line with, so they, they are very competitive with regard to the choice that if I have to go and rent on a long permanent lease, the rate that I'm paying and the rate that I'm paying when I go flexi are very close to each other. The differential is around 12%. In Australia, I think the differential is around 12%. Um, in the UK, the differential is closer to 8%. So the choice makes sense. As a business, I can make that choice easy. Whereas in South Africa, the, the differential is about 1,000%. Um, if you take 50 square meters in Santon, you're probably going to pay about 8,000 or between five and 8,000. If you go flexis place for the same amount, you're probably gonna pay close to about 16,000. So, so the, the point Paul you are making is right. The, the choice is, is that do we wait? Right now we're going through COVID. We need to, to flexibility is the order of the day. Do I wait until that, that gap closes? Or do I make the choice now to say, okay, Justin, you're right, I'm gonna lock myself in. So somewhere in between, so Justin's medal might not work because I'm not gonna make a long-term decision in the middle of a COVID, but at the same time, so it might happen that me and my dining room are gonna be big buddies purely because the cost of, of taking any of these flexi work doesn't make sense. Uh, that's why I was saying at the beginning that at some point at a very household level, um, at a very bit, we, you, we're gonna make that cost benefit analysis. I'm gonna say, do I go and pay 4,000 um, so that two of my staff have, have a good working environment at a flexi office per month? Um, or do I sit at my dining room and then I can, I can, I can carry the additional 16,000 while I'm in my, in my dining room? And, and those margins are the ones, and, and this is I think the point that Inet was, was making earlier on to say, those choices might not necessarily end up being choices being based purely on what I need to do and the cost that I need to pay. It might be that what else is available for the type of business that I'm in, in order for me to be able to leave my house, to now go and stop working from home, to now go and work, at, 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 to make a choice, to now go out. And it, 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 it's also a factor that it, the, the market is not that competitive. Um, 
Uh, there are new players that have come in. I think Justin's and, and, and Linda's businesses are the, are the players that are trying to diversify the market. But it's diversifying very slowly because your older players um, are still sitting with a large stock that they need to get rid of because that stock cost them money. There was a price they paid for it. Um, and they're not going to downgrade that cost purely because uh, the market sounds different. If, if, if I paid a billion rand to put up a building, there's a cost I must pay to be able to have a, a good return on that building. The level at which I can sacrifice that yield, it will determine, but the, the, those, those differentials are, are not sustainable. I agree with you, Paul, they're not sustainable. They have to come, mm -hmm. start coming closer to each other. Then you'd see people moving in large numbers to the flexi offices. Then you'll see the number of flexi offices increasing uh, and, and then the, the competition leveling out. So well, what you say is that no, 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 sorry, Linda. I, I, just, I just do want to touch on, can we come back to that? I just want to touch on, on, on the refurbs quickly. I, and I, our team will help facilitate that you and, and Justin share your schedules. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we can compare notes. But I think, um, I think Justin, just, just quickly, because it a, it's a really interesting topic. I mean, how suitable sure. is commercial space to, to conversion into residential? Just talking about the supply and, 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 and certain segments of machine we're talking about now. So, yeah, I mean, I can talk about this for a long time, so I'll try to sum it up quickly. You've got, um, you got, you got two minutes. <laughs> okay, well, for, firstly, I think what's great about the conversions, especially of these offices that are empty or becoming empty, is generally to give people great accommodation at really good prices. You need to build very large developments to get economies of scale. And to do this, you normally have to purchase land far away and build on land far away from workplaces, which isn't very inclusionary. Um, but with these big buildings becoming vacant, and they're generally in prime, prime locations, close to schools, churches, places of worship, um, rest, uh, in places of entertainment. Um, it gives, gives the excellent locations, gives one opportunity to build world-class accommodation and facilities at very affordable rates, like in great areas. So that, that is one positive, I think, that may come out of this, that, that there, there are these buildings becoming available and uh, people can live closer to, to better amenities. And yeah, and, and you need that scale. The whole point is you need the scale. So you need these big buildings. You can't, you can't build with economies without the scale. Um, what not every building can be converted, and that's the tough part. You know, you read these articles that half of Sant and CBD will be converted. It's not possible. The main restricting issue is your floor plates. They're generally too deep, too wide. So you, you've got a lot of dead space or unusable space. You won't get a higher rental when you, when you rent apartments that are slightly larger, it's generally set rentals for bachelor, one bed, two bed. Um, your rezoning is a big issue. It's very, very expensive to rezone. Very, it takes a lot of time. Your windows, a lot of modern buildings, their windows don't open, which means you have to have windows that open for apartments. So you have to redo facades of the whole building, which is extremely expensive. Um, there are quite a, a number of other factors. You have to have decent areas for common area, uh, de decent spaces for common areas for these buildings. So it's not an easy thing to convert. It's, 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 very, it's actually very, very complicated and tough. But where you do get the right buildings, uh, can be in great areas, which give people, you know, awesome opportunities that to live in areas they previously would not be able to afford. Paul, do you agree there? Yeah, I agree um, with Justin that it's not a solution for all the empty office buildings because not office building, not all office buildings are um, appropriate for residential. The other thing is, and and although vacancies have grown, so if if a company has got, and I think the national vacancy levels are about fifteen percent, sixteen percent, which is high, probably uh, the norm would be around ten percent. So certainly we're seeing greater vacancies. But if you've got a, a building that's 16% vacant, it means you've still got 84% of the space occupied. And typically your office values are too high to accommodate a, a residential development um, or a reconfiguration because value has to come in, at, well, the building's got to come in at the right value initially to make it work. And so it, it works in specific cases. In fact, we're doing some work with, with Justin and, Af and Africrest. Um, and... Uh, I think the ones where it does work are fantastic, but it's not a silver bullet for uh, the other supply. Got you. Um, so guys, I mean, I think we knew it was going to happen. We're going to run out, out of time. There are a, a lot of questions and, and comments that have come through. I think uh, Tracy Myers, and I know you've asked about the demand for conversions, so we, we, we've touched on, on that. Um, I think just in terms of a few, uh, a few other comments that come through, Adile, um, Guni, in terms of from a 
from a, a, a comment perspective, leaders need to manage output more than input. Uh, why must it matter where the staff are if they are producing? I think that's that's a whole discussion for for a different day. But I think it's been touched on by by quite a, a few of the guys. Um, um, purification systems, a lot of stuff that we haven't had had a chance to really really um, unpack. Um, the habits um, have they changed positive or negatively over this period when it comes to um, employees and I guess employers to specific areas at work. But um, I think. I think just a, a big thank you again to uh, to the panel members. Um, I mean, like we say, we can we could I could listen to you guys for hours and, and debate various different things, but I think it really provides a, a very very balanced um, uh, sort of outlook on where we are. I think we're in a bit of a bubble currently. I would love to see things go back to to the way they were as a as an employer, and I know a huge amount of our staff in a very very small environment would love it too. And I think it just there are so many different dynamics to it, but um, I, I really believe that for the economy to be to be strong, people need to be at offices, people need to be evolving. Like Justin says, you need to be training seven days a week as opposed to three days a week. And I think so many different things. So I think this is this is the kind of stuff that that that's uh, that's exciting. And I and and yeah, and thanks again to everyone. Like I said, we will be um, we're doing a recording. We'll be circulating that recording. And uh, again, thank you very much to all our all our panelists and thanks to all of you guys for joining we've had a huge turnout and i think a lot of a lot of comments and just thank everyone for their valuable time cheers guys thank you so much thank, thank you. you thank you thank you thanks thank so you. much really appreciate cheers, man. Thank you. thanks a lot